Hello again, you've made it to the end of day one of the National Mentoring Summit. I feel like congratulations are in order. This day was packed with some amazing opportunities and throughout it all, you've continued to show up ready to engage, connect and learn. And I must say, you all are looking a bit smarter than you did this morning. What do you think, Rachel? Oh yeah, it's definitely a smarter looking bunch this afternoon. We hope you've enjoyed our workshops and if there's something you learned or a quote you think that others would benefit from, we encourage you to share it in the chat and on social media using the hashtags Mentoring Summit and hashtag Mentoring Amplifies. And no, there's not a space between words and hashtags. And we know it's harder with us not all being together, but please keep exploring our spaces where you can visit our exhibitors, network and connect and learn from others. For this final event of the day, we will be shifting our focus to the topic of mental health. I'm guessing that for all you folks working with young people today, it didn't come as much of a surprise when a few months ago, the three leading child health organizations and the Surgeon General declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. I know I wasn't shocked. Being a young person has never been easy, but the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a lot of instability and stress, taken away places and people important to us, and contributed to a rise in the toxic side of social media. It will take all of our current efforts and much more to mitigate this crisis. We all deserve as much. Over the next hour, we will hear from experts and colleagues on issues and strategies for addressing the well-being of our nation's youth. And what better way to get us started than to hear from a young person themselves? I'm extremely excited to introduce Dee Dee, an amazing youth spoken word artist who will be performing an original piece titled My History. My History. My History is an economics lesson. It's cause and effects, it's politics and policies. It's an easy A. Take the class, read the syllabus, write the essay. My history has become a grade and I am not okay with the way that they downgrade my history. They tell you what the county says. They summarize it in a few short words and put it in textbooks. They paraphrase the suffering that my people faced. One semester isn't enough to learn about chains. One semester isn't enough to learn about rape. One semester will never be enough to learn about my history. Do you know my history? That in 1787, I was only three fifths of one person that they had to compromise to figure out what my worth is. Do you remember that? Do you remember that lesson? Or did you just forget it? I mean, I don't blame you. I blame your skin. I blame your privilege. And I know right now you're thinking, oh, how typical. A thick lipped, broad hips, brown skinned girl talking about race here, avoiding eye contact because you're scared to look at me in the face. You're scared of what you'll see because in my melanin lies so much history. They say black don't crack and they're right. It doesn't, it shatters, it tears, and it breaks. I was born with a gun held to my head. I was born into life, but my complexion conceived my death as a kid. My mother told me to be careful because they watch each breath, they measure each step. In second grade, you learn how to multiply by two. And in my history, that is the only rule. You have to be two times smarter. You have to work two times harder. You have to learn how to keep your mouth shut or you'll be an article on TV just like Eric Garner. My talk wasn't the birds and the bees. My talk was how to face the police in my 16 years of life. That is my history. Keep your mouth shut. Turn your music down. Put your hands on the dashboard and don't make a sound. Show him your registration. Show him your ID. Even when you didn't do anything wrong because I want you home safely. My history isn't just a lesson. It's not just part of some curriculum. My history is the sculptor that created me. My history is the reason a teacher asks a young black boy, what do you want to be when you're older? And he says, I want to be alive. Slavery ended years ago, but the crippling poison of racism still resides. The emancipation was just a document that a white man signed. Whether he wanted us free 
or to feed his pride. I don't know, but my history isn't just a lesson you can sum up in a few words. My history is my life. And so when you ask me where I am from, I say here, because you took me away from my motherland and made me a slave all these years. You split apart families and no matter how much time you try to glue it back together, there will always be tears. You took my history from me. You beat me down and tell me to stand tall. You cut off my legs and asked me to walk. You asked to feel my hair and tell me it should be straight. And every time a black girl gets braids, you ask, how long did that take? You always assume that my hair is going to be fake in school. You asked me in a survey, do the things you're learning about represent your race? But there's no option for it. Yes, I see my race only when we were slaves. You only show me when I was in chains. You don't show the beauty of my motherland. You don't show the richness in my skin. You show the pain and I'm not here to pin the blame, no. I am here asking. I am begging that our educational system should change because at the beginning of each day you ask us to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And so everybody stands, they put their hands on their hearts, they turn their bodies to the flag, but I refuse to get up even if they get mad because they say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And by the time they finish the last line, I feel like crying because they say, with liberty and justice. But the only thing I can think of is for who? Is it you? No, I'm sorry, say, is it you? Because it's definitely not for me. If you take your time and look through history, you'll see that they made Jim Crow an eagle and they called that liberty. This is my history. Wow, I think we all just witnessed the next Amanda Gorman. Thank you, Dee Dee, for those powerful words. I know they will stay with me well past this summit. Next up is Dan Gillison, CEO of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, with some insight into what youth across the country are going through and how it impacts their mental health and well-being. Hello, welcome to the Mentor Summit. My name is Dan Gillison, and I'm the CEO for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We're the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, with over 650 state organizations and affiliates across the country, bringing resources, education, support, and advocacy to your community. For decades, young people have been facing enormous challenges when it comes to their mental health. This crisis was only made worse by the isolation, uncertainty and fears brought on by the pandemic, which is why I am so glad that Mentor decided to focus a plenary on youth mental health. Mentoring can play a huge role in a young person's mental health and well-being. I know this firsthand. The first time I ever got on a plane was when I left for college. When I got to Louisiana, I was 1,200 miles away from home with no friends or support system. I felt like a fish out of water. On top of the distance and the newness, I didn't have a lot of money in my pocket, so I used to eat meals of popcorn and what has become more popular but was very new back then, ramen noodles. That is why it's such a it was such a relief when one of my professors, Dr. Henry Young, invited me over to his family's home for dinner. He and his wife, Evelyn, and their children immediately embraced me as their own. It was the first time I felt like someone saw me since I left home. I was instantly visible versus invisible. I was also incredibly quiet and reserved when I was younger. But Dr. Young saw through my shy demeanor and, and knew there was a voice trying to get out. So he met me where I was and encouraged me to take a course where I had to do some public speaking. He coached me through the process but he also made sure I was supported by the community of students around me, my peers. He knew that with a little bit of community, I could thrive. And that mentor, he was right. Dr. Young saw my potential and helped me grow. But it was not the academic or professional development that made the biggest difference for me. It was knowing that I was not alone. That's what mentors do. 
And that's why they're so important to the overall well-being of a young person. I was not okay when I got to school, not by a long shot, but Dr. Young taught me it was okay to not be okay. And that I was not alone in my journey. And that's the message we can spread to young people today through mentorship. People care about you. You are valued. You are loved. You are not alone. And always remember, as a mentor, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thank you to everyone that is a mentor and to all the young people looking for mentorship. It is there for you and we will be there to help you. All the best with your summit and thank you. It's okay to not be okay. Wow, that is a powerful lesson that Dan shared from his mentor, Dr. Young. Thank you, Dan, for your leadership through NAMI and for your willingness to share your personal story. Dan's inspiring story is a great reminder that today is Thank Your Mentor Day, a time to voice your gratitude for the people who've been there throughout your life. You can engage on social media by posting your mentoring stories with the hashtags, hashtag thank your mentor and hashtag mentoring amplifies. Check out the thank your mentor day card on the main page for thought starters, prompts and inspirations for your posts. To continue elevating youth voices, we'll now be hearing directly from a group of young people from Rhode Island. They will share their experiences living through a pandemic and highlight ways that adults and programs can best support them during this challenging time. Let's give it up for the youth ambassadors from the Rhode Island Department of Health. Hi, my name is Jessica Marizon and alongside me are four of my peers from the Rhode Island Department of Health Youth Health Ambassador Program. The Youth Health Ambassador Program is a leadership program that engages high school age youth as partners in public health programming and policy and amplifies youth voice at the Department of Health. We all represent different cities, schools, ages, backgrounds, and experiences across the state of Rhode Island and are committed to benefiting the public health of our communities. We want to thank the National Mentoring Summit for offering us the opportunity to share our perspectives today. Today we'll be talking about the importance of mental health and mentorship, especially during the times of COVID. All that being said, I will now allow for my fellow ambassadors to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Amol Rathor. I live in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, and I'm a junior at the Wheeler School. Hello, my name is Karen Bullock. I live in Providence, Rhode Island, and I'm a 12th grade student at the Met High School. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Marizon, and I live in Cranston, Rhode Island, as well as attend 10th grade in Cranston East High School. Hi, I'm Joanna Fashton. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a senior at LaSalle Academy. Hi, my name is Caroline Monaco. I live in Smithfield, Rhode Island, and I'm a junior at Mount St. Charles Academy. Great. Now that all my peers have introduced themselves, I will move on to the first question. What are the mental health challenges that young people face today? Yeah, that's a great question. And for me, I think some common mental health challenges that come to mind that are faced by the youth today include anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and substance abuse, including alcoholism and illicit drug use. Unfortunately, these issues have been significantly worsened by excessive social media and the social disruption due to the unending COVID pandemic. Issues of sleep deprivation, self-isolation, low self-esteem, and suicide have also all been exemplified as a result of these problems. I think our social batteries have just been drained due to the fact that we just couldn't interact with other people in person for so long, and it's still very hard to do so today. Um, I think also being expected to perform just as well in school as we did before the pandemic is very stressful for all of us, considering that we had to spend so much time on online classes that for most people were not really that all that helpful to them, and it was much harder to learn. And simply not feeling productive enough during everyday life during the pandemic has been really hard on all of us. That was great. Um, I will now be moving on to the second and final question. How can mentors slash members of the audience guide youth and help them navigate these challenges? I believe that just by choosing to become a mentor, you are already helping them by becoming an outlet for them and by becoming someone that they could go to when they need to talk about their challenges and feelings. The most important step that mentors should take in order to provide guidance to their mentee is establishing a relationship built on trust, support, reassurance, and most importantly, consistency. And when I say consistency, I mean being there with them through both hardships and successes. And it's very important for mentors to understand that each individual is different, therefore their struggles will be different. 
And lastly, make sure to be a confidant to your mentee. Listen to them, be patient with them, and always tell them that there's hope. Again, great. Thank you so much. Um, I would say when personally dealing with mental health in the pandemic, complete transparency has been a great advantage. Youth are more capable than we're giving credit for it. As youth, we can't always solve the problem and we shouldn't be expected to, but in many cases, we can be a part of the solution. Lastly, I think mentors and adults that work with youth should start including us in decisions that impact us. I firmly believe that most, if not all, of today's youth can wrap their minds around the fact that things like the pandemic are nobody's fault and therefore it's not your fault. A mentor should be someone who understands our frustrations aren't personal and is willing to listen and advise in a healthy manner. We can't ask for you to solve all our problems and that's something that we understand, but we can ask for someone to comprehend and consider the situation we're in. It's also important to understand that as a mentor, what an adolescent needs can change at the moment. Being able to identify, and it's okay to ask, how you can best guide youth in the moment enables stronger communication and trust. Because let's face it, things change all the time. All that being said, we want to thank you on behalf of the Rhode Island Department of Health Youth Health Ambassador Program for taking the time to hear us out. And hopefully our personal experiences and point of view are able to help the future of mentoring. Thank you. Thanks, Mentor Rhode Island, for making that connection to the Youth Health Ambassadors. I love when we as young people are called upon to offer our advice and wisdom. Keep listening to us! By connecting individuals with shared experiences, mentoring has the power to promote positive self-identity development and foster self-love and confidence. Here to talk more about that is Sana Giovanni, founder and CEO of the Love Your Natural Self Foundation. Imagine being in the seventh grade and losing all of your hair overnight. I remember this moment. I was 12 years old and I woke up. I lifted my head from my pillow and it felt somehow lighter. I remember running my hands through what was left and getting chunks and chunks of hair. Immediately I looked back at my pillow and knew that I had lost most of it. But I couldn't get up and I couldn't look in the mirror. I was shaking because I was terrified. I had an autoimmune condition called alopecia, and it had grown really, really aggressive overnight. I remember grabbing my cell phone and calling my mom, who was right downstairs, but I remember telling her, Mom, can you buy me a wig? Just slide it under the door or something. And of course, as a mom, she was like, let me help you. Let me come upstairs. And I told her, no, Mom, I don't want you to help me, because if you look at me, you won't love me anymore. And I know that because if I look at myself, I won't love myself anymore. And that's truly how negatively I felt about myself. We bought a wig, um, but it did not look like my real hair. Unfortunately, we knew very little about wigs, so the one we found was red. As you can imagine, that's not my natural hair color. And so when I went to school, immediately everyone knew it was fake. There was a lot of challenges that came in my, with that, from gum in my wig to mean notes in my locker, one even titled 50 Ways to Go Kill Yourself. I remember that I could barely get out of bed. I was scared to go to school. My attendance dropped so far low, and I didn't know if I could ever get through it or feel better. I had a moment sitting in the locker room. I didn't know if there was a way out. I was holding a mean note I had gotten and honestly just contemplating suicide. At the time, I was also struggling with self-harm, and my mental health was at an all-time low. My amazing gym coach, Coach Linville, walked up to me and handed me an application. Through tears, I asked her what this was, and she said it was an application to lead our school's anti-bullying club. I didn't understand this at all. How would I lead our school's anti-bullying club if I couldn't even stand up for myself? How was I going to use my voice for others if I couldn't even advocate for my own needs? I remember asking Coach this question, and she simply answered, Helping yourself and helping others are more related than you think. So I took the application and decided to apply. I felt like I had nothing to lose at that point. I became the president of our school's largest student organization, which was the Anti-Bullying Club. I immediately found my voice. I led meetings, I hosted school assemblies, and I realized my love and passion for public speaking. Coach Linville was right. Although I couldn't stand up for myself yet, this experience helped me realize that I had a voice. And realizing 
the power of my own voice eventually led me to self-love. Coach Linville was one of the many mentors who truly changed my life. I remember sitting in that locker room feeling like everyone had given up on me, but Coach Linville saw the leader that I didn't know I could become yet. And eventually I found my own voice and knew I could become that leader. I found the courage to go without my wig. I remember posting a video on Facebook, just pulling off my wig and telling the world, this is me and I'm proud of who I am. People really, really responded and resonated with that. I got messages from students telling me that because you went without your wig, I feel like I can stop self-harming. Because you went without your wig, I feel like I can come out to my parents or get help for something I'm struggling with. I realize that when you have the courage to be who you are, you unknowingly inspire other people to do the same, and I thought that was the coolest idea ever. And so I wanted to do more with that. At 15 years old, I decided to create a nonprofit organization called the Love Your Natural Self Foundation. We provide K through 12 curriculum that focuses on mental health and social and emotional learning. I fell in love with running my nonprofit through high school. I had a really unconventional experience traveling around the globe, giving school assemblies, and really, really just using my voice to help others. The lesson Coach Linville taught me was reinforced once again. I knew that by using my voice to heal others, I was also healing myself, and it was one of the most rewarding experiences I ever had. We have grown so much and now serve 150 campuses and reach about 50,000 students a year. An initiative that started with just me going without my wig just on my campus has grown so deeply and I could not be more grateful. Fast forward to college. I was a first generation college student and I wasn't sure if higher education was even for me. I remember debating if I was even going to apply. I wanted to run my nonprofit full time, but on the other hand, it felt like college was what you were quote unquote supposed to do. And so I just remember feeling really conflicted. I always had a deep desire to go to college and felt that there was more that I could learn. I just didn't know if I was capable. But again, nothing to lose, I decided to apply. Within the first few weeks of college, I started struggling so much. I didn't feel like I was smart enough to be in school, and I didn't have the funds to run my nonprofit full time, so I felt like I was losing and failing in every category. I remember meeting another mentor, Dr. Eisenberg. The moment I walked into her office for our first meeting, she had done her research and she said, you do not know this yet, but you are going to be this campus's next Truman Scholar. After more research, I found out that the Truman Scholarship was a public service fellowship for grad school. This idea seemed nearly impossible to me, as I wasn't even sure if I was going to finish undergrad, much less thinking of grad school. But after three years, I was announced as my campus's um, second Truman Scholar in the university's history. Dr. Eisenberg, similar to Coach Linville, believed in me when I had forgotten how to. And so I think it comes down to this idea that when someone struggles with their mental health, they often forget who they are. During my deepest periods of depression and self-harm, my brain was in survival mode. I didn't know how to imagine a future for myself because, quite frankly, I didn't know if a future even existed. I was just trying to get through the day-to-day. -day. I was just going through the emotions. Mentors step in and visualize what you're not able to see. They see you for who you are and believe in the capacity of who you are. They believe in your capacity for healing, courage, change, and impact, even when you may not see that yourself. So today, at 24 years old, while still running my nonprofit full-time, I also run a mentor recruitment program for an amazing nonprofit called Generation Hope. The story has begun to come full circle as I now mentor young people around the globe and help connect individuals with the mentors they need. I've learned that mentors support you on your worst days. When you need the most love, compassion, and support, mentors come in and provide that. They bring compassion and understanding, but also they bring something more. They bring hope and perspective. During my lowest moments, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get through them. I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to accept myself, and I did not see a future for myself. But I will forever be grateful for the mentors who came in and got me where I am today, to a place where I can confidently say, my voice matters. So thank you to everyone who's ever been a mentor, who's ever seen someone through their worst days, who's ever seen someone at a low point of mental health. I know that I was struggling with depression, self-harm, suicide, 
and I didn't see a tomorrow. My mentors not only saw a tomorrow, but they saw a tomorrow full of hope and promise and courage and change. Thank you so much. What an inspiring reflection and testimony to the power of the love and respect we all deserve. Sana, thank you. I needed that right now. It's awesome to hear from so many different people who have devoted their lives to providing others with unconditional support. The Mentoring Partnership of Southwest Pennsylvania, one of 25 mentor affiliates located across the country, helps drive this work for the mentoring field with one of their trainings titled Mental Health First Aid. Let's see this work in action. Sana, thank you so much for the willingness and the courage to share your personal story. Hi, my name is Michelle Thomas. I am the Director of Training and Program Development with the Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania, an affiliate of Mentor. I'm here today to share the work that we're doing in our region to help support mentors around mental health and first aid, specifically for young people. As you heard from Sana from her personal account, the reason why this work is so important because in order to help young people feel seen and heard, as mentors, we have the opportunity to help increase our noticing skills and recognize should a problem arise. We have been doing uh, leading mental health and first aid trainings in our region for about five years now through the National Council for Mental Wellbeing with local support from Allegheny County Health Choices. Why is the work important? The second leading cause of death in individuals 10 through 34 is suicide. As mentors, we are similar to uh, CPR and first aid. As mentors, we have the opportunity to be first responders should a mental health crisis or concern arise. Um, and that's not only as mentors in our everyday, the everyday hats that we wear with working with young people. I'm a mom. Some of you may be coaches. Some of you may be teachers or youth pastors or have uh, friends who have young people. So it doesn't just stop at mentoring. It's important that adults have the skills equipped to recognize signs and symptoms should a mental health crisis arise. We all have an opportunity to make an everyday mentoring difference in the life of a young person, despite whether or not we are matched formally mentoring a young person or not. So the training that we lead provides adults and mentors the skills and tools they need to have an action plan should a mental health crisis or concern arise. A lot of those things that walk you through the action plan are just being able to listen without judgment, being able to connect young people to appropriate professional help, to connect young people to appropriate self-help and other support strategies. If you are looking to take part of a mental health first aid training in your area, please go visit mentalhealthfirstaid.org and look for a training near you. There's in-person and virtual options available. Also, the work we lead in our region is around ongoing supporting mentors in regards to, to mental health and mental well-being. So if you're looking for weekly information that may center around mental health or just tips and strategies on being an everyday mentor and what that looks like and working with young people, feel free to visit our website and sign up for everyday mentoring tips where we share mental health resources, infographics, etc., tools that you need to help put in your toolbox so you can be similar to son as coach or college advisor and be that person that helps make a mentoring difference difference, visit our website at mentoringpittsburgh.org. Thank you so much for taking the time to dedicate your skills and expertise and, and the willingness to listen so that we can ensure that young people feel seen, heard, and supported. What a great resource. Thank you, Michelle. And just a reminder to everyone watching, if you're not already connected to Mentor or a local affiliate, you can check to see if there is a mentor affiliate in your area by going to mentoring.org slash affiliates. And regardless of where you are, you can receive free training through the National Mentoring Resource Center. Now, it's time to hear from someone who I cannot believe I have the honor and privilege to introduce. 
Up next is New York Times bestselling author, Dancing with the Stars champion, literacy advocate, and of course, U.S. Olympic champion gymnast, Lori Hernandez. Rachel, thank you so much. I am so excited to chat with everybody today and share some little tidbits of my story that I think a lot of people have either not heard about or maybe they don't know about me. Um, just to kick things off, I, I've done gymnastics for 15 years professionally and being able to be a gymnast on the 2016 Olympic team, that was something that was so surreal, but um, I was 16 at the time, freshly turned, and so I think ignorance is bliss, really. That phrase played a big role in that because it's just teenage me walking into the arena and going, well, I guess it's just another meet. And, you know, the Olympic rings are <laughs> hanging around. So that's that's quite the kicker. But there's some things outside of that that I think a lot of people would, you know, I, I, think every, I think all of you would like to hear about it. So one of my favorites is that my mom is a social worker and a therapist. My sister is a, is a therapist and, and has her own private practice. I see a therapist. And so mental health has really been something that's played a huge role in my life and something that a lot of people don't know is that before I'm competing at any competitions, I do get really frazzled. And sometimes I would cry, I would get really bad stomach aches, I would have panic attacks and have to kind of like pace around in the corner and visualize over and over again out of like a nervous habit, not out of like, oh, you know, I'm gonna go through my routine because it makes me feel secure. I'm like, I have to go through my routine, otherwise it's bad luck. <laughs> so I'm a really fun teammate to be around. I, I am, I swear, especially now, but when I was a kid, it was a lot. And so there was a lot of like me crying and getting nervous, but over time, I think being um, in that pressure firsthand, I learned how to cope with it a little bit better. So it turned into belly breathing. It turned into taking a deep breath and blowing out the candle that is your finger. Um, it turned into putting my hand on my stomach and looking down and when you take a deep breath, you kind of watch it expand and watch it go in and watch it expand. And by doing that, it just takes your mind off of the stress that you're in. We're gonna talk about moments before I learned any of those techniques where I would sob and cry. One of my favorites is that, uh, not gymnastics related. I went to take my driver's test. Oh my gosh, wait, no, hold on. This was after the Olympics. So this is still happening. It's okay, we're human guys. Um, in 2017, 2018, I think it was somewhere in there. I went to take my driver's test. This is post Olympic games, okay. And may I just add, I finally learned these techniques at the Olympics, went in, hit a good routine, got gold as a team, got silver individually for balance beam. I walk into this driver's test and I sit down and immediately just start crying um, because I have, spoiler alert, I have really bad test anxiety. <laughs> and a lot of times as someone who is homeschooled, this was something that would really stress me out if I had to take a math test or a history test or whatever. It would usually result in me crying and forgetting all the answers and having to take a five minute break because <laughs> before we even started because I was just really frazzled but you know over time again you learn to breathe so the driver's test sat down immediately started crying and then started picking answers that would you know if you get 10 wrong after 10 you're kind of you're done for so I would purposely get 10 wrong and would just select answers so that way I could get out of the DMV as quick as possible and then got into the car and cried and I remember my mom being like it's okay Everybody feels their first driver's test. It's fine. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, whatever, you know? So I go back a second time, and the second time around, I sit down, and now I've kind of like Pavlov dog myself into thinking that when I sit at the DMV, I now cry. So I start getting really nervous and start like getting really sweaty. My heart's beating really fast. I can hear it in my ears. And um, I'm trying not to cry so hard. I'm like, just think about your answers. I need you all to know, I know the answers. <laughs> I know them. And what was happening was every time I would get nervous, my brain would do this thing called flooding where I am so nervous, I completely forget anything that I've studied for. What I didn't know was how to fix that and that it would actually be using the same tools that I'd be using in gymnastics. So what's really puzzling to me is that I could be on a world stage and compete and use my body in all these crazy ways, but you sit me down and ask who has to make the left turn first at an intersection, sop, tears, okay? And so I remember getting into the car and crying and being like, I'm never gonna pass, something's wrong with me. And my mom was like, no, you're just anxious. <laughs> and um. It was a lot. It, it was really frustrating, you know, those two times. And my mom was like, don't worry, I did pass until my third time too. Third time's the charm. 
And so I get in there and I go into the DMV and those first two times were in New Jersey. This third time is now in California. And I sit down and I'm like, okay, let's, let's think about this. The first two times I sat down and I cried and that's okay. Cause I was having a lot of big feelings, but those big feelings got in the way of me being able to pass my driver's test. So logically what's going to happen here. I studied extra so that way I could make sure that if a question came up, I had the familiar language in my brain, which I know is the whole point of studying, but I did just, I kept studying thinking that that was going to fix everything. And yeah, it was really helpful, but it was my nerves that were getting in the way. So going back into gymnastics, you know, and being like, okay, we're competing. We're doing mental gymnastics right now and sitting in this DMV and putting my hand on my stomach, and taking a deep breath or putting my hand on my chest and kind of feeling the pressure, like skin on skin for my hand that always feels really good and just taking my time taking my time reminding myself that i'm not being rushed that nobody's watching me and that if it gets wrong again that we just try again next time but everything's gonna be okay it's all gonna work out and sure enough spoiler alert i passed this one and now i drive around left and right so <laughs> i think a lot of people really get a kick out of you know, an Olympian crying over taking a driving test, a written driving test, just because at the end of the day, the things that stress us out is different for everybody and learning to cope with those things. It's not that next time I go take a test, I'm getting ready to go to college. Next time I go take a test, I'm going to have to take a test. I'm not going to be able to sit and say, well, I'm going to leave <laughs> or purposely fail the test so I can leave. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. But what I can do is know that, you know what? I am going to be anxious for the next test. So let's pre prep for that. What are things that we can do? Sometimes chewing something like gum, if you're allowed, uh, that helps just stay stimulated. Learning how to breathe, which breathing exercises work the best. Um, drinking water when you feel like you're out of step, going to another question and coming back to the one that you were struggling with. Sometimes you just have to cope with those things. And they get easier as time goes on. And as someone who's been competing for 15 years, I can tell you right now, it does get easier. You don't get less nervous. You learn how your body gets nervous and how your brain gets nervous. And you work around that. Everybody is unique. Everybody's different. And if somebody says, well, just don't be nervous, it's not very helpful. But what I can tell you, take lots of deep breaths, reset your brain, and that everything's going to be fine. So that's kind of my first little story. I think my next one would probably be that I... Trained in a location for 11 years. I was in an environment where I started at five and ended at 16. And um, it was interesting. I was with the same coach from that point the whole the entire time. And what's tough about that is that this coach um, and well, me as well as a handful of others ended up filing her under emotional and verbal abuse um, because the training was just not a good environment. There was a lot of yelling going on and, and there was just a lot happening that, you know, to this day, there are some things that you're looking back on and therapy, it's like, oh, wow, that came up. I didn't realize that was a problem, <laughs> um, which happens, you know, it, it, it still stings, but something was done about it. And uh, there was, you know, there was a suspension that happened and it's making sure that we're making, we're making sure that our kids are going to be safe, especially practicing in gymnastics. And so, Two years after 2016, I had taken a break. I hadn't done any gymnastics and I realized that I missed it. And it turns out that I didn't hate the sport. I just hated the environment that I was in. I love flipping. I love being upside down. I love competing. I love being able to perform at the best of my abilities, but it was the environment that was making me feel like I hated everything around me. And so I was like, well, maybe if I change the environment, then things will feel a little more well-rounded for me. And so that's what I did. I moved to California, farthest place you could go from New Jersey. <laughs> um, but I moved to California and I went to this new gym. And what was interesting about that was this coach was completely different than any coach that I had ever seen. She was very reserved, knew what she wanted of me. She was always like, okay, you tell me what you want and where you want to go. If you want to go to the Olympics, I will help you get there. If you want to go to a training camp, I will help you get there. If you want just to get these new skills or this certain routine, I will help you get there. But you have to tell me and you are leading. I'm not leading. I am just your guide. I am someone who gives you support. I am someone who tells you how to do things when you ask. Until then, I stand to the side and let you know that you have my support. And I was like, well, this is new. It's weird. <laughs> Never seen that before. And I remember the first couple days of kind of practicing there, 
feeling really anxious and it was building and I realized that I was waiting for this coach to yell at me she was gonna I was like well she has to blow at some point you know she's gotta everybody gets upset (laughs) and after like day three or four I ended up going to the bathroom and having this huge panic attack because I thought this impending doom was coming you know this big blow up was gonna happen and it never came which was almost worse because that's what I was used to and it's like well maybe if the big blow happens then it happened and I know it's gonna happen and everything's gonna be okay but you know trauma really responds to patterns and to um to routine to habit and habit for me unfortunately was getting yelled at a lot and so we had to do a lot of resetting and a lot of okay let's take a step back is she upset or am i just thinking that she's upset should i ask (laughs) the answer is yes or you know if anything it's like she's not upset she's actually really passionate right now and and you know it may be the same mannerisms there's a lot of that going on Needless to say, it was so interesting of going and competing at 18, 19, 20, 21 years old versus competing as a 16 year old simply because of the environment that I was in. At 16 years old, it was, I'm not nervous, I'm fine. Look at me, look how strong I am. I don't want you to perceive me as weak. I don't want you to perceive me as anxious. Not that those two things go hand in hand, but that was what I was taught. And so it was like, I don't want you to see me as any of those things. I I'm stronger than that. I am not nervous and I'm not nervous because I put in the work and I put in the work because I don't want to be nervous and I don't want to get yelled at. And so it went from that to being 20 and my coach saying, you know, my new coach saying, well, yeah, you're going to be nervous. Of course, you're going to be nervous. Everybody, why wouldn't you be nervous? You haven't competed in four and a half years. Of course, you're going to be anxious. This makes so much sense. Take your time. You've practiced this so well. I believe in you. And she would say those things right before I compete. And, you know, it went from, I'm not nervous at all to, yeah, I'm terrified right now. And that makes sense. (laughs) I should be nervous. (laughs) And being able to acknowledge that I was nervous made me less anxious for the routine that was coming because sometimes your feelings just need a little bit of acknowledgement and they get bigger and bigger until you look at them and say hi I see you and then go oh okay bye (laughs) that doesn't happen all the time but the competitions or the training camps that I was in it was I am so anxious right now because I know that people are looking at me as the 16 year old even though I'm 21 and that my body's changed and that I have changed and my gymnastics looks different that makes sense so let's go do what we practice for. <laughs> and that's that's kind of the difference of like good coaching slash good mentoring versus bad coaching, bad and bad mentoring. The way that we talk to our kids and the way that we talk to our students is everything. It is everything. And so I encourage you all, you or if you're a teacher, if you're a student, whatever it is, to be, you know, your favorite self because sometimes your best self can look like pressure and um, I I guess these expectations of other people, you know, whether that be your parents, teachers, friends, whatever it is, what does your best self look like? Your best self may be that you study a little more than you do now or that you give yourself more breaks than you do now. Your best self may look like, okay, I am going to get anxious before a test, but how am I going to work with that rather than pretending it doesn't exist at all? Or your best self may be you see somebody struggling and your your best self says, you know, or your favorite self, your favorite self, your favorite self says, I want to show up for other people. I want to show up for myself. Your best self may say, okay, well, I need to be perfect for everyone around me and I cannot be anxious. I cannot be perfect. I have to be able to pass the expectations and the pressures of other people. I have to be able to meet what everybody wants me to do. Your favorite self says, okay, what is it that I want? How do I want to handle things? How can I help other people? How can I you know, acknowledge my emotions and work around those things. So look into that, maybe make a little list. What does your best self look like versus what does your favorite self look like? And see if there's a difference. Because if there's not, that's that's fun, you know? <laughs> but for me, there's, there's a very big difference between the two, there still is. So um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me chatter on and about and kind of share all these things that I feel like a lot of people may not know. I I feel like it may be really helpful. These are all things that I wish somebody had told me growing up um, that everybody, and it's not to invalidate, but everybody gets anxious. Everybody gets scared. Everybody gets really sad. It's just how we work with those things and how we can show up for ourselves and for other people. 
So hang in there. You got this. You're doing great. Good luck. Thank you, Lori. I promise I calmed down enough to pay attention, and I'm so glad I did. I'm so appreciative that professional athletes and other influencers are using their platforms to shine a light on this issue. Destigmatizing mental health challenges and making resources more accessible is so important. In this next panel, we will be hearing from some mental health experts who have dedicated themselves to raising awareness. Sarah Schaefer, Executive Director of Mentor Minnesota, will moderate this discussion. Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi folks, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Sarah Schaefer and I'm the Executive Director of Mentor Minnesota. I'm also a founding board member of Queer Space Collective, which is a queer youth mentoring program here in the Twin Cities. Um, we who work with young people uh, continue to see mental health support as a huge need in 2022. So we're here today to learn more about how our young people are experiencing mental health and the ways that we can all show up for each other. So to dive into this topic, I'm joined by three super inspiring innovators in their work. We have Dr. Ahada McCummings, who is a parent, a coach, a sports health researcher, and the Senior National Director of External Affairs and Organizational Learning for Up To Us Sports. We have Richard Taylor Jr., the founder of TaylorMade Empowerment. He's a mental health expert, speaker, consultant, and an author of many books. And Dr. Michelle Munson, who is a mentor, a mentee. She's directed mentoring programs and is now the mentoring researcher and professor at NYU Silver School of Social Work. So thank you so much for joining us, the three of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to pose my first question to you, Ahada. It's evident that your personal experiences ignited a passion for helping young adults and girls in particular. So we'd really love to hear more about how your personal experiences helped shape uh, the work that you do and help us understand how young girls and especially young folks of color experience mental health differently than their white peers. So I think that my work, particularly with girls, came about because I have two girls. I wanted to make sure that they had everything that they needed to be successful. I also wanted to make sure that all of their girlfriends that I was meeting and coming across and their teammates that I was meeting, that I was coming across, were also getting the very best as well, and that they were making sound judgments and decisions about the wellness of their own lives. And so that's really where the passion about um, how we interact and treat and serve young girls and women started. Um, and so I, I started in the field of counseling. I got a master's degree in counselor education. That then moved to doing sports psychology and working with athletes, because both of my daughters are athletes as well. They both played collegiate volleyball um, and one played overseas. And then I wanted to then switch and be able to use those same skill sets to work with adults and organizations all in the realm of this holistic wellness, of being well of performing at your absolute best, no matter what it is, whether it's in your personal life, your academic life, your professional life. Um, and so that's just a little bit of history about how we got here. In terms of your second question about how girls and people of color experience mental health differently, I would say this, Sarah, that we, and this is a misconception, I think, and, and if anybody has had the opportunity to watch, there's a film, a documentary called um, Push Out, the criminal, criminalization of black girls in schools. Um, and what that film talks about is this idea that somehow girls of color, particularly black girls, are seen as though we cannot be hurt. Um, that we don't feel the same things that everyone else feels. And so there's this misconception that we experience emotions differently. We don't. Pain is pain. Sadness is sadness. Anxiety is anxiety. We don't experience it differently. Our experiences may be different, but we don't experience the emotions any differently than anybody else. And unfortunately, what has happened is that people take that notion that we experience it differently to mean that we then can treat you differently, that we can be much more abusive towards you, 
that we can do all types of things to you and it's okay because you're stronger, you don't experience the emotions the same way as other people do. Um, and so what I would say is that what's different sometimes for girls and for people of color is that how it manifests is what's different, right? That's what's different, that my sadness may come across as anger. My anxiety and my fear may come across as anger. And so that's what's different, not the emotion. And so I really want to challenge people to get away from this idea that my fear is different than your fear. Fear is fear. How I experience it and how I manifest it and project it in life is what may be different. The first thing I would say for mentors is recognize your own thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and biases that you hold about girls and about girls of color and what you believe about them and what you think to be true about who they are. That's the first thing, because I think what, what we're lacking, not just in the space of mentoring, but just in general, is that people lack the ability to have some self-awareness about what their thoughts and beliefs are about other people. So that's the first thing. Be aware of where you are in your own development before you start going out and trying to help others be aware of where they are in their development. That's great. And I, I feel like this, um, this idea of self-awareness and really understanding yourself um, also speaks to, Richard, your experience, which I first want to say thank you so much for sharing your experience with the world. You have impacted hundreds of thousands of people through your story and being so raw and honest about uh, your own experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to how relationships and community, which you speak about relationships and community quite a lot in your work, how, how relationships and community supported you in your personal mental health journey and what might others be able to take away from your experience? Early on, it was a struggle in sharing because I came from, you know, this culture of what happens in this house stays in this house, right? So the the code of silence, never speak on it. Um, you know, I had family members that were really big on the idea that whatever you put out there, um, somebody can take your, your story and try and twist it or taint it or use it against you later on in life. But one of the things that I started to understand as I dove deeper into the story sharing aspect was that nobody can control or share my narrative the way that I can, right? So if anybody is listening right now and you are in the space, in the field of helping people, I would say that like nobody can share or taint or twist something more than you have the power of controlling it because it is your story to understand. And I love what Dr. McCummins, how do you said it, you know, where you talked about this, this idea of, um, you know, like as you as you share, like you are you are giving so much. You're sowing seeds that you won't see the result to right now. And in that, I know sometimes it can feel like a lonely road. It can feel like, oh my God, am I? You know, what's the point of this? And I just want to say that there is value in what you do when you share. So I know I just threw a lot out there. Hope it made sense though. But that that would be what I say. Take away from that experience. Oh no, I love that, Richard. I love this idea of your you're sowing the seeds now, because I think that's really true in a lot of youth work. We don't necessarily know the impact we're going to have right away. Um, and that's the kind of beauty of human development even. You might not know until 20 years later and you see that young person really blossom. Um, yeah, and so I just wanna bring it back uh, to something you mentioned before about sharing your story and that can be such a valuable and important way to connect with people. Um, and Dr. Munson, I want to bring you into the conversation because uh, kind of with that, often mentors come to the table and they come to these relationships because they want to share their story and they want to help and they want to support. Um, but it can get really gray because mentors are generally not therapists. Um, and even if they are, there are two very distinct roles at play. So could you tell us a little bit more about what, so this is a two-parter, what mentors can do to support mentees who are currently seeking therapy? Um, or are already engaged in the therapeutic process and what mentors can do to support mentees who might not be engaged in a therapeutic process. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for that question, Sarah, and thanks for the invitation to you know, be on this panel with these amazing folks. So I would, I would highlight a few things. First, I would actually say in thinking about this for all youth, 
those who are in therapy and those who aren't in therapy. Uh, mentors can be particularly supportive just by talking positively about mental health challenges, talking positively about the possibilities of therapy, because we know stigma is alive and well, and stigma about mental health challenges and getting professional help is a barrier even for those young people who are in therapy. So first of all, something I often call normalizing talk, I think that's key for all youth. And then particularly you pose for young people in therapy. Specifically, I think mentors can, and I've seen mentors be helpful um, in supporting continued engagement and treatment in a couple of different ways. So some of our mentors, they help, they're not the therapists, as you say, which is a really important distinction, but they can be helpful with their mentees in helping them process what's going on between them and their therapist, which can be, you know, rocky at times. Also, mentors, kind of like we've just been talking about, they can be particularly helpful as role models, just like Richard was sharing, by sharing their own experiences and being that, I would say, beacon of light for a young adult, you know, representing somebody positive um, who also has mental health challenges. And if the mentor themselves doesn't have mental health challenges, they can put, you know, one of Richard's books in their hands <laughs> or, or, or some other role model um, and provide them support that way. And then I would say for those not engaged in treatment, um, mentors can also just help promote mental health and well-being in all kinds of ways. Mm, that's great, Dr. Munson. Thanks for sharing that. I, I do know that there's a lot of research, which I'm sure is also some of your research about the power of, of mirroring this sort of work, of being that role model. As a, an owner and a coach of a youth volleyball organization, Ahada, I want to bring you into this conversation um, because I feel like that might resonate with you because in your counseling of teens and organizations through mental health, um, I would just love to know from your perspective, what do you tell coaches and teams, uh, sports teams, to help them be more aware of the mental health of their players? Sure. I think that, you know, Dr. Monson mentioned it. The language that we use is very important um, when we're um, talking to our coaches, when we're talking to our mentors, when we're talking to our educators. Um, the language we use is important. And we need to understand that there is a history within this country or within, around the world, really, about what mental health means. Um, Richard mentioned it, especially in Black communities, there still exists this um, stigma attached to mental health, right? That um, for generations, our families have talked about mental health in such a negative way um, that if you are seeking treatment, that you are crazy or that something is wrong with you, right? And so we have to change that narrative when we're educating others and, and bringing awareness to others about what mental health and mental wellness is. We may not ever, Sarah, get to a point where we can completely get rid of the stigma that's attached to mental health, right? That's a reality. And that's not, and I want people to understand, don't think that people are resistant or um, that their ideas are unfounded because they are founded. It's, it is rooted in something, right? that you know last year we had the american psychiatric association and the american Psych the american so uh, psychological association put out um, apologies about the role that they played in the systemic racism um, throughout history right so it's not unfounded it's not some crazy notion that's out there that people just kind of made up it's real and that just like systemic racism and slavery is generational and it, it gets carried down and passed through families and people hear about the stories of their family members who were part of research studies who were part of all of these things that um that were unethical um within their families so it exists and so we can't move into this space and get rid of it by saying hey your thoughts and your ideas about mental health is preposterous because the reality is, is that it's not preposterous. But people are dealing with adverse situations. We call them ACEs for children, right? Adverse childhood experiences. Well, those adverse situations don't stop in childhood. They continue to happen in adulthood. 
And so if we can create spaces within mentoring, within coaching, within teaching, of which we teach kids how to control our emotions, when we teach children how to um, breathe and get centered, when we teach people how to cope with these things that come up in life, that's how we create the space and the narrative that it's just about being well. Mm, That's great, Ahada. Thanks for sharing that. Dr. Munson, I'm going to bring it back to you. I think most of us can recognize the time when we've either either seen a young person going through a mental health crisis or we ourselves have gone through a mental health crisis. I know we all want to create opportunities for young people to access care and access support. So for those of us who are working with young people, what does it look like for a mentor to recognize that a young person is struggling with their mental health and uh, what should they do? I think I would just start sort of um, hearkening back to what Ahada said about how mental health challenges can look so differently to every different youth. So I would sort of start there. Just um, there are some common signs, um, right? But just remembering and being mindful that, you know, can look very differently for, for each different young person. I think one of the first things I would say is just as a mentor, you know, or just an adult in a young person's life, just if you notice something is different or something doesn't seem quite right with with your mentee, just trust your gut and try to open up a conversation, um, you know, at that point, you know, early on. And then some of the other things that we commonly think about are when young people or mentees might suddenly have a decreased interest in something they have always enjoyed, right? So if they've enjoyed playing sports or talking to you about movies, and suddenly they're just not enjoying that anymore. Also, and I think very uh, timely right now, withdrawal from social relationships that have been important to them, including their relationship to you, right? So is there some kind of a social withdrawal? And then certainly a sudden change of emotions or a kind of an unusual persistent sadness or worry. If a youngster is just like worrying seemingly more than than usual and also irritability, right? Or or having more irritability than, than, than you've seen in the past. And then your second question is also so important. What, what can we do, right? What can mentors do? We can be really important linkers, you know, for mentees to both care professional care, right? And and what do we need to do to, to be those linkers? You know, we need to be open. We need to maintain good listening. We need to be curious about our mentees' emotional lives. And this also goes back to somebody's earlier comment that we have to start with ourselves. So how comfortable are we with, you know, just meeting our young person with their emotions and their emotional lives. But I think if mentors do that, and if we come, if we become better and better at that, we can be a key link in the chain. That's great, Dr. Munson, because I feel like that also speaks to this idea that you're not the therapist, but you can link them to a resource that might be able to help them find a therapist or find that like immediate mental health support. Um, you also kind of mentioned a, a little bit around identifying things in yourself, kind of understanding yourself, which I know, Ahada, you mentioned earlier, sharing your emotions. And Richard and Ahada, you both talk a lot about destigmatizing mental health. I know, Richard, I love something that I heard in one of your podcasts about being shameless about your mental health, uh, but being shameless about your emotions, which I just think is a really fresh and, and important way to approach uh, mental wellness. So could you either of you, and so this this is open to both of you, but could you paint us a picture of what accomplishing an open and supportive relationship around mental health could look like for a young person? I'm, I'm always sharing with people is this idea of bridging the gap, right? I'm like, you don't need to be everything for everybody, but knowing your role and where you are and how you bridge that gap to, to bring hope and allow hope to lead to them getting help. Um, yeah, Ahada had actually mentioned earlier about the wellness aspect, right? And I thought that was so important. So yes, the reason why I talk about the idea of being shameless when it comes to your mental health, uh, the my latest book, the first chapter is called We All Have Mental Health, right? And this is one of the components that I've been using to help destigmatize, right? This idea that 
just like our physical, we all have a physical body. We all have a mental, right? And we've got to be able to invest into it the same way. We've got to be able to take the time the same way that we will with our physical body. And so um, I think this is why I've been so big on being shameless because of the fact that I'm like, hey, our triggers look different. Our traumas look different. But at the end of the day, one of the ways we can destigmatize it is by saying just because you haven't been affected in the way that another person has doesn't mean that you can't, right? And so hopefully from that, that we can do two things. We can take a look at ourselves and say, let me chill out. But then also we can take a look at others and learn how to greater empathize. You know, there are several things that I'm really big on when it comes to the investment of the mental, right? And it for me, I'm big on journaling. Um, I think that being able to, you know, write down just a few sentences. It doesn't have to be a book or a, a thesis paper, but literally pulling out your phone, typing in your notes, you know, highs and lows from the day, what, you know, what experiences you went through. And the beauty of that for me is that it's kind of given me an idea, even if I did it for three or four days out of the week of patterns, right? Like what patterns am I seeing within myself? What patterns am I seeing maybe within some of the, the, the friend groups that I'm around, the people that I'm around? But then also too, um, I mean, we talked about the community component, um, but I think even just in self-identity, right? One of the big things that I'm always big on is asking yourself the hard questions. So in this whole space of being able to identify it, um, that's those are probably three of the, the greatest things for me. And then after I identify certain things, I do go back to that community to ask people who I know have my best interest at heart, right? I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can't heal on half truths. So we gotta be open, we gotta be honest. And so these like practices here, I believe are a great start to helping us in that. And as we grow in that, it is easier for us to become a little more shameless as we move forward because we are so focused in on us rather than everybody else. What does this person think? How are they going to look at me? But I, I was at, I was talking to a group and I said, you had a purpose in life before anybody ever had an opinion about you. And I think that was the big part that really helped me when it came to my identity, when it came to being shameless, and when it came to actually starting to identify things within myself and putting some action steps behind it. If I can, if I can add to, to what Richard stated about um, this idea of speaking to your community and, and how we check in, check in and check on one another, right? That we make it normal to ask rather than asking, how are you doing? But asking, how are you feeling, right? Are you okay? Um, and being given the space by those around us, our mentors or, or whoever, to say, no, I'm not, I'm not okay today, right? And, and being able to say that that's normal, that everyone has days where you're not okay. Everyone has weeks where you're not okay, right? Everyone has years where you may not be okay, um, but as long as you know that there are people within your sphere, your circle, who are concerned about that, who check in on you about that, who um, support you in that, that that is, is really, really important. Mm. Yeah, that was that was beautifully put, Ahada. Um, I think normalizing it for everybody is important. Working on ourselves is important, that we can understand others. Thank you to all three of you for joining in on this conversation. I feel like I'm leaving with a lot of resources and ideas to take forward into my own work and my own personal experience. So thank you for joining, um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. What a way to end the day. Thank you all for everything you do for young people. And thank you for taking the time today to share your expertise with us. Tomorrow is another day full of great learning experiences and networking opportunities. You won't be seeing us until the afternoon, but with your morning packed with workshops, visits to the Exhibitor Hall, and the Excellence in Mentoring Awards at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, we'll be together before you even have time to miss us. Also, Throughout this plenary, you may have found yourself thinking, wow, these MCs are rocking some really cool swag. Well, I'm excited to share that these clothes could be yours. Well, not these clothes, but ones that look pretty similar. All you have to do is make your way to the Mentor store, which is located on the main page and at Mentor's Exhibitor booth. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you tomorrow.